we're going to talk about Emo database, which is uh, the BB content storage system. Uh, basically, EmoDB started off about a year and a half um, ago uh, with a big push for a new data structure uh, that should be able to handle um, higher level scale, like on a totally different level, it should be easy to scale and replicate and it should be um, multi-master. Um, so, keeping that in mind, uh, the name comes from a word play. Uh, from store your sentiment and emotions and all that. So that's why we came up with EmoDB. Uh, a little bit about Bazaar Voice. Uh, we are an Austin-based local company. Well, I wouldn't say local company anymore. It's a global company, Austin-based global company. Um, we have uh, engineering offices in San Francisco and New York as well. Uh, that's a little bit information about myself. I'm a senior software engineer with the uh, data infrastructure team. And there's uh, my email address and my LinkedIn profile. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with Bazaar Voice and what it does. And this is more than a marketing slide. I just want to set some context on what kind of data we deal with, what is the scale of our data. and. Even though it's not consumer-facing site, chances are everybody has visited our servers. And the reason is that we are on the product pages of most of the major retailers other than Amazon. Um, so when you visit Walmart or when you visit Best Buy and look for a camera um, and, you look, uh, and you're looking at reviews, those reviews are directly being served from our servers. And so if you look at global monthly unique visitors, we're about at half a billion monthly uniques which is right up there with all the biggies that you must be familiar with uh, at page number seven. Uh, just to give you a little bit more context, um, monthly stats, and I'm not gonna go over every one of them. Uh, you can see that it's, it's, it's large. Uh, you know, just 16 billion review impressions every month, and all, all those nice stats. So before I go further with Emo database and tell you what it is and what we use it and you know how it does what it does, I'd like to just take a big 30,000 feet data infrastructure that we have as our voice. And I'd like to set up what the objective and goals are for EmoDB. And we'll, we'll see, um, then we'll narrow down that these are the goals that we want and these are the objectives that we have for EmoDB and then how are we gonna accomplish that? So EmoDB is the lowest level, which is, um, which is directly interacting with the data. This has the system of truth. Um, it has raw data, if you will. Um, we call it system record. And it is based off of backed by Cassandra. And it's not just one ring, but multiple rings. Uh, for different things, and we'll get into the details for that. Uh, there are massive global rights, by the way. Can everybody see what it says? <laughs> it's like there's uh, massive global rights going on here, which is one thing that we have to take care of, is that our rights have to be um, as much non-locking as possible. As a matter of fact, no locking should be there. Uh, the other thing that we have interesting is we need to watch changes. So we have a data bus layer right here, data event bus. And every time a change is made in a record, it should trigger an event on that data bus. So as you may imagine, there are going to be listeners on that data bus. So that's point number two. First thing is massive global rights. Second objective is that we need to alert any subscribers who are listening whenever change happens. The third and probably the most important objective and goal for EmoDB is scans. So you have about like 650 million documents and we should be able to scan all of those and be able to index them. Uh, basically we use Elasticsearch, but you, know, you can use indexing technology of your choice or for any other application that you may want. So this is not exactly data book. This is more, you can say, when you are trying to boot up a new indexing cluster for yourself. You want to go ahead and, OK, and, and, and say, I'm going to start from scratch. And I know you have a lot of data. We have 
you know, seven years worth of data, which we were just talking about. And I want to go ahead and index all of the documents that you want. So I want sequential scans, and I want to do it quickly now. Here's the kicker. So we don't even have one Polloi cluster. Uh, and by the way, this is in itself is a rules engine. This is internal rules engine, which is backed by Elasticsearch. We're not going to talk about that. But I wanted to talk a little bit about it here just to set the context. Uh, essentially what Polloi is, it is a rules engine where anybody can create a Polloi cluster and it will create Elasticsearch cluster for them and you can provide it rules. So for instance, we have product reviews and ratings. So someone can say, you know what, I'm not, I don't care about reviews as much. I just want the product catalog. But one small little thing that I want is with every product, I want average ratings and some statistics on that. And that's all I need. So he would write rules using our, our domain specific language that we wrote for Ploy. And he would say, okay, give me all the products and just make sure that for all reviews you do, you take the average, you take the max, you take the minimum and so on and so forth. Then Ploy will create this elastic search and it will, it will take those rules into account and will give you everything that you need and then your searches and queries and all of those things are its responsibility. Um, so the kicker that I was talking about is that you can have more than one Polloi clusters. So this is as big as it is. We have multiple indexing. What that allows us to do is the main objective of the new data infrastructure is data should be flexible. So you should be able to store anything. You should start storing any content type. So tomorrow, instead of reviews, you want to store recipes or something. You should not um, have to re-architect your entire solution. And this provides us, this, in this kind of 30,000 feet level infrastructure provides us that. So if you have another application, uh, by the way, it doesn't have to be just Poloi. I know in the diagram it's just Poloi, but you can have your own application that can listen on to the data bus and can do a range um, or a scan for all the documents. So keeping that in mind, uh, the goals for AmoDB store in a flexible way, just throw anything at it. Uh, you support universal content type, which is basically any content type without any re-architecture. So um, like I was saying, reviews or um, recipe, brand campaign, stories, etc. Watch for changes for data events, so that's a biggie. Um, and we'll talk about that in detail. This is one really cool thing. Um, being in the service-oriented architecture, we wanted to expose a RESTful API. So our consumers don't have to know specifically about Cassandra. It's all RESTful API. Um, and um, so we provide that. Plus, it is multi-master, multi-data center, fault tolerant, horizontal scale. Um, all of this last bullet point is basically why Cassandra was chosen. Um, any question, by the way, so far? Because this data infrastructure slide is important when we get into stuff and we're doing things, what we're doing. So just interrupt me if you have any questions. And, and you mentioned the global aspect of the rights. Can you talk a little bit more about the, <coughs> the rings and rings? Yes, sure. Um, so basically, as I was mentioning here, and maybe that what you were talking about is this point multi-data center. Uh, we wanted to be able to have uh, the data centers in multiple regions. So not just availability zone, but it should be in the US, uh, US East and US West. We have three regions right now. So the rights, um, and, and I'll get back to your question, because the global rights, when, when you write, uh, one of the main things that we do is there is no synchronous communication between da data centers. And we'll talk about how we resolve conflicts in a minute. Another question. For a multi-master, do you mean the same thing as this peer, or is there some other meaning in there? No, that's it. Okay. That's what exactly what Cassandra um, offers you. Comes from a background of MySQL, where you've only got one master, and you're kind of stuck with yeah. that. So these are basically the components for EmoDB. Um, we are really going to focus on system of record and data bus. 
Uh, reason is we also offer Q service and blob store, but Q service is uh, very much based on the data bus. It is, you can call it our internal SQS, um, and blob store is pretty much like system of record, but it's more tailored towards storing images and videos and, and things like that. All of which are, by the way, backed by Cassandra. So one of the things um, you can think about is system of records has um, two Cassandra rings, one for um, UGC, which is user generated content, and another one for catalog. Um, Databus has its own Cassandra store, and it uses things that, that makes more sense for Databus. So system of record um, introduces a concept of tables. This is not to be confused with the column families that we have in um, Cassandra. Uh, table is just, just that, like we wanted to offer our consumers a way to create however many tables you want to create. And it has to be very cheap. Um, it's basically a bucket that contains JSON documents, what, what you would think a table should be. But the important thing is that we can have tens of thousands of tables. And um, the other thing is it offers a way to fetch any particular row ID, just like you know you have Cassandra, but here you'll have a RESTful API. You can give it a row ID and it will return JSON back at you. And then as I keep harping on, complete table scan. Actually, are you gonna talk more about table scan? Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, I'm gonna talk about more about okay. uh, table scan in a minute. So this is just an example of what our RESTful API looks like. You know, a typical RESTful API, you can create a table, and it will return you a success true, and you can store a document um, um, in it. So, and, and this is um, really important. So, because they're tables, they're gonna be rows. So, concept of rows is very interesting for us. We only do append, whenever we insert, we are appending deltas. These are all deltas, so when you are writing a row, and deltas can be create, update, or even delete. So a delete um, operation for a particular row is also a delta. Uh, the cool thing is every time you write, you don't care what the delta is before it, you just write another column to your row in Cassandra, and you put delta there, and it's partial updates. Um, I'll also show you the syntax how it is, but if you want to add another property and a, a new property in your delta, the syntax will just give you just that property and the new value for that property, or it can change an existing property. But regardless, the main point is that when you write to a particular row, you're just inserting one delta. You don't care what there was before, you don't care what that is after. The job of resolving all these delta into one um, document is when a read happens. So EmoDB, when somebody asks EmoDB, give me this row, it will go in and it's gonna resolve all the deltas that are in there and then produce um, a document that you really want. Due to this, there, there are two things. So there's also a concept of compaction which is emo compaction I'm talking about. This is not Cassandra compaction. And basically, as you can imagine, these deltas can grow, and every now and then, opportunis opportunistically, it will go in and try to compact these delta and write a compaction. Then it will delete a lot of these columns and put a compaction record in, that, in, the, in, in, in the place of that and move on. So one of the limitations of EmoDB because of this structure, and it is by design, is if you have a high update to create ratio, then it's it's probably not a good system for you. So if you think about user generated content that that we usually deal with, um, the review is written, and after that there are maybe a few more updates. So it may go to a moderators, and moderators can approve it or you know add some more metadata to that piece of content. But pretty much after that, it's hands off. If you have something that you're continuously updating um, as the same record, you can imagine that these deltas can keep growing on and it will keep give a lot of load. It will um, uh, impact compaction. And so when you read those rows, you may see you know, big time read latencies. 
Is, is this concept clear, by the way? I just want to make sure that everybody. Because because of this design, we get a lot of advantages. We get to exploit this design a lot. So there are three ways to read data access, uh, or three ways of data access from EmoDB. There's lookup by primary key, there's bulk extract, uh, and then there's change feed, which is the data bus. So what's missing? Uh, obviously, it's uh, where, join, group by. If you're thinking about querying EmoDB, that's not what it does. You would rather have Poloi Elasticsearch, which we use that, that is our, our main thing for complex queries. So now we come to the data store challenges. Um, remember I talked about um, creating tables? It has to be very cheap. So anybody can send a RESTful API and say, okay, create me a review colon test customer table or something like that. And it should quickly create that table for you and say, yes, okay, your table is created. And now when you create that table, expectations are, okay, now I'm gonna just start start storing documents in that table, and then I should be able to uh, scan that table. Now, if we were to dedicate one column family for one table, that's a megabyte of memory in Cassandra 1.1. That is way too much overload. Um, so I'm going to give away one thing, is we will use just one column family for all the tables. Now assuming, in, uh, before going into complete solution, uh, that we have solved this problem by using just one column family, there arises another problem, problem number two. And this is where the scanning comes in. So you can imagine that if you have all your tables, and let's say somehow each row is identifying itself that I belong to this table. That's all fine and dandy. But now when you want a sequential scan, you have a problem at your hands because you have only one column family that stores all the tables that stores tables of Walmart and then also stores table of Best Buy. So you need sequential scans to be quick. Plus you also want it to be distributed evenly across your cluster. You don't want hotspots. Um, so here, it's, it's quite a challenge because you only have one column family. And so your shards for each table should be fully distributed over Cassandra cluster. Um, any questions there? A any, 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 any questions regarding why is this a challenge or why is it difficult or anything like that? Okay, so I'll, I'll go move on to solution then. So solution to both problem one and two. Um, the row key. The row key byte buffer that we have contains a nine byte table prefix followed by a UTF-8 encoded key. So the first uh, byte is an eight bit shard identifier and the second or, or the next eight bits is a 64 bit table UUID. So it's not the table name but it's a UUID that you create uh, for that table. And then the rest of it is a UTF-8 encoded key. The way we determine shard is we take a 32-bit murmur hash of these two guys, so basically um, the UUID and the UTF-8 encoded content key, and then take the bottom eight bits of that and stick it in front of that row key. So what you have is you don't have that typical byte order partitioning where you say, okay, letters from A through J go here or you know things like that because we all know that that causes hotspots. This kind of randomizes um, your shards. So, so basically shard identifier serves to spread content for the entire cluster and that avoids hotspots. And for parallel scan, the, another good thing about it is because we have eight bits of shard identifier, uh, you get 256 uh, range queries and you'll, you can do those range queries in parallel and you can get, um, you can do the scanning. Um, so Nate, you had a question about the scan that's that kind of, or? Right, yes, it is. So, and there you have it basically, a single column family offering segments, which is basically table, and each one of those segments are not only sequential 
but are also distributed evenly or fully through the cl cluster. The table UIDs also solve another problem for us. So uh, obviously we now know that we can you know, store multiple tables because we have table UUID. Um, but also because we're using UUIDs, it allows us to drop the tables and right away recreate a table with the same name because this time it's gonna give yet another UUID and that allows us to delete those records lazily. So they may exist there, but nobody can access there because now it's a completely different UUID, even if the names are the same. So I'm gonna go over a quick um, sample of how we do parallel scan, like actual code sample. So the two RESTful API for that is you first call for splits, given your table. And once you get your splits, then you can call your splits in parallel um, and loop over all the records. Uh, that's, we also have a Java client, so that's um, the equivalent of, of the API. I really doubt you guys, well, maybe you can see it, okay. I'm not gonna go over the code. All I'm trying to show here is that using Java client, you make one call to get the splits, you get your splits here, and then in your for loop, you're basically spawning off uh, separate threads to go over each split, and each split is gonna give you all the records. Um, now I'm gonna talk about deltas problem solved for scanning and and all the big challenges is solved now. Question, question. Yes. Do you have like uh, some kind of guarantees about splits being distributed so parallel scans work better or is that sort of, you know, relying on the randomness of it and Cassandra to it, distribute them? It, it's, as, it, it's as much guarantee as a random order path partitioner okay. will, pro will provide you. And that's the thing about the 8-bit shard identifier that I was uh, kind of, uh, talking about earlier. Because of that, uh, when you uh, do range queries, you can add the most, because you have eight bits, you have at the most 256 range queries. But with that range queries, you can completely parallelize it, and you can just get sequential scans because of that. Right. <coughs> How many machines are in your cluster? Right now, we have um, 15. 15 total node cluster that is spans over US and EU. How do you add machines? So, interesting question. The only thing that this adds is your overhead for administrative overhead. Um, we use Freem, but we use a forked um, copy of premium Freem to do administrative type stuff. And it, um, so when you double the ring, it's, it's much easier than you keep doubling it but there are operations that you need to do, obviously, um, when you add one or two, or just, just like add another single node. Um, so this is really cool, um, uh, deltas. Um, sorry. Fork, uh, sorry. Sorry. Which fork or frame do you use? Is it a custom neural fork? Or? Yeah, it's uh, pretty forked. Um, what did you change? Uh, do you remember which version was it when we actually started? We have to, yeah. And we have our own byte order part But it's, it's pretty far back. It doesn't work. Um, so I mentioned about deltas. So, you know, the cool thing about deltas is when you're writing them, you don't care whether I'm creating a conflict or, hey, I need to isolate my row first and then write and do whatever. You're just writing a delta. And this is true for create, update, or delete. No matter what you're doing, that's just a delta. And as, a, as I had the graphics earlier, you're just, you're just appending deltas to your row. Um, as readers are asked to read for a row, um, any given row, they'll just go in and they'll evaluate these deltas. So that is why it's really weak consistency. So notice that there is no document level logging. 
So what can happen is a scenario like this, where you have, assume you have two data centers, data center A and B, and you start off with a document, something like this, and we'll call that delta T1. So at, um, so at T1 time, um, you have this document, and both data center A and data center B are aware of T1. Then T2 comes along, and this is, by the way, a review, and T2 says, okay, I need to add another property, um, the status equals approved, and it goes to data center A. Now data center A has T1 and T2. T3 goes to data center B, but T2 hasn't reached data center B yet. And what T3 does is it adds Facebook ID to that review. So at this point in time, if somebody, if some application goes to data center B and asks for this document, they're going to get T1 and T3. And if somebody goes to data center A, they're going to get T1 and T2. So data center A does not have Facebook ID. Data center B does not have status as of this time. But eventually, and that's why we're living in an eventual consistent world. So two seconds later, you will see it does guarantee that you will have uh, both properties at both data centers A and B. So if you think about this for a second, this is typically a replication conflict. Typically when you write something to the document or you're modifying the row, it's, it's replication um, conflict and you're gonna say, okay, which one is the right one? Which one should I go? You can say, okay, I'll, I'll go with T3, it's latest, but this one doesn't have status in it, so you're gonna lose that. Uh, for us, this is much easier now because each delta specifies only the fields that it modifies, and so the deltas merge very cleanly and, and produce the desired result. Also, if you notice that there are no cross data center synchronous communication required at this time. All that is required is regular replication. Uh, it's eventually consistent, so yes, you, if you, there may be at some point where you're not getting all the fields, but again, uh, in an eventually consistent world two seconds later or two days later if the node is down, um, you will get everything, the, the, the right document. What if you have conflicting deltas? I'm, I'm sorry? If you have conflicting deltas in your example, of it's two and three, both are the status attributes? Yeah, so then it will uh, follow the regular resolving algorithm. So let's say if your um, D3 was modifying the status as well, uh, remember, oh, one of the things I may have forgotten to specify about deltas is we have change UUIDs, which are time UUIDs, so you always have that. So if your T2 is a status approved and T3 is a status rejected or something, then we'll basically replay the entire thing in that order. So th that's actually a good question because, uh, let me take some more time. time do you use? Huh? <laughs> Whose time do you use? NTP's time. Okay, so side of the last right wins then, even if it's wrong. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. So it's a sort of a last right wins policy. Yeah, but it kind of reduces it by a lot because that will always happen when you have. Um, yeah, it, it will order it in that way. You're right. Yeah, it will order it in that way. But one of the things that is cool about it is because we have deltas. Um, we have something called bulk ETL. So we're ETLing from a legacy data system. And we have incrementals going on as well. So when incremental ETL happens, uh, you get T1 here, T2 here, and T3 here. And let's say we started a bulk ETL at this point, at T0. This is gonna do a MapReduce job, which will take a long time. And the reason why we are doing bulk ETL in the middle of the incremental is because there are gaps in our new data structure. Let's say we want to close up all the gaps that has happened. And so we started a bulk ETL here so that any gaps in, in the new data structure are covered. Uh, but at the same time, we don't want to lose incremental um, data that is coming in through the pipe. So 
we'll take our own sweet time to do MapReduce job and transform and extract and all that. And then finally, we're going to place our delta here. It still does not affect um, anything because guess what? The UUID, the time UUID, the change ID on the delta is still T0. And when I'm writing it, the writer has no concern whatsoever that, you know, I'm, you know, have newer changes in there or anything. I'm just going to go ahead and write this delta in. The reader, when the reader comes in, it will order it, it will know that, okay, this is T0, this is T1, this is T2, and T3, and it will resolve it in that order. Is the ETL opportunistic, or is it just scheduled? ETL it can be ad hoc. The bulk ETL is ad hoc, and um, incremental is, is even, it's not like scheduled, it's, it's triggered. So whenever okay. something comes in. Okay. Yeah. And then the time is just taken off that, the deltas are taken off that uh, ETL timestamp. Yeah. It's uh, whoever is taking care of ETL actually puts the timestamps on it. Okay. Or it's not timestamps, time you like. Okay. Which, So the way um, deltas operate, it um, has a recursive pattern matching approach. Um, you can set a value, you can delete a value, you can update a value. Um, as you can imagine, there's no operation like just modifying a list. So if you have a list, you can either replace the entire list or you can delete the list. If you have um, a situation where you have a list but you want to apply deltas to particular elements of the list, then uh, you model that as a map. And if you are not sure about the keys to use for this map, usually time UID is a good candidate for listing of the keys. Uh, main reason being it gives you a natural sort order right away. So that is one thing that you have to take care of. There's some operation um, in deltas, so we have a literal, which is basically a smash operation. What that is, is I don't care what you have in your timeline before this. This is my literal now. This is the state of the truth now. So it's basically smashes all your previous deltas. Um, all the rest of the, and this is more domain specific language for us, but when we have a dot dot in front of it, that, that's basically an incremental delta that you're applying. And whenever you want to delete something, you use a status and you use like a tilde sign which tells it, okay, delete this key from my record. Um, the map one is pretty self-explanatory. Um, yes, there's one thing. The last one, that's a conditional delta. And we're going to talk more about that. Uh, what basically the last uh, example is doing is it removes a key if the value is approved. So only if the value is approved, then go ahead and remove the status. I don't need status anymore. So conditional deltas, we have conditional deltas that can perform a delta conditionally based on whether a condition is still true at the time the delta is evaluated. So you can basically, um, say that I want to, you know, regular writes, but before you do a write, you can read the object. Um, you can say, okay, this status is approved. I want to do something to this object, and I want to write back. But I want to write back conditionally that the status is still approved, and it hasn't changed since then. So this is essentially designed to help resolve the most common concurrent write problems on modifying your objects, because as an application, you kind of realize that this is my most concurrent write. There will be multiple writers on this object. So this will help you reduce um, the, uh, you know, the common concurrent write conflict. It is a simple and reliable method to do that. Um, basically, for example, in this one is basically uh, what I just described. If you want to mark review approved only if moderation hasn't begun. So we have some clients who want um, optimistic approach to review. So if you have written a review, it will publish right away. But then the moderator will come later on. And if there's something objectionable about that review, they'll reject it. 
So in this case, what, what, what the conditional delta is saying is that if the submission text ID is this, then go ahead and set status to approve. Um, I'm not going to go into each uh, type of conditions, but just know that we have conditional deltas which takes care of equal, um, you know, um, map and or constant. And this is what I meant by recursive uh, uh, approach. Uh, so in this example, what you're essentially saying is that if the type is a product or a category and the client is test customer, do something. Um, I'd like to uh, mention something really interesting now. So read, modify, write. Basically what it happens in a happy state is you read the original state, you compute the new version based on the original state, and the happy path is then you write conditionally to it, asking it only write if the original uh, condition holds, and write goes successfully because nothing has happened in the middle. Or what can happen is eventually the write conflicts and data bus fires an event for application to detect it and retry that write. So what I mean by that is what can happen is the application to, to the application it may seem like the write just went through, no problems, but later on EmoDB can retroactively fail uh, your write and give a trigger on the data bus that we talked about early on saying that, hey, your con there was a conflict in one of your conditional rights, you know, do something about it, and then it's up to the application. So how that happens is these are two data centers, data center A and data center B. Um, and this is the timeline going downwards. So initially, data center A and data center B are uh, synced together. They're at T1 delta. And then application talks to data center A and says, okay, employ this or apply this uh, conditional T3 based uh, on the fact that the original delta is T1. Concurrently at the same time, just a little before that, T2 arrives in data center B that invalidates this conditional. But remember we said that there is no synchronous communication between data centers. So what's gonna happen is data center A who does not know about T2B yet is going to go ahead and pass it. So the application is going to think that T1 and T3 is, is fine. But then when T2 gets replication to here, it will fail at this point and produce a trigger on the data bus. On data center B is the write flow, if you will. T1 happened, T2 happened, and application tried to write T3 and it failed. And this, basically, there is no locking. Yes, there is a little bit of different approach where you get this, but then you also get a data, data bus trigger. And the data bus trigger is guaranteed that you will get it so that applications can react to it. Yeah. So with that trigger, is it uh, then reading the records again to discover T2? Yes. So trigger will happen when you're pulling this data bus event, you'll know, okay, something happened, and we'll tell you that this that there was a conflict, and it, the actual um, document is T1 and T2, not T1 and T3 anymore. And then basically the applications can either retry the write, or they can you know, forego it, do whatever you want, basically. Okay, but so basically anytime you have the, the conditional delta come in, it can, it can require rereading or sorry, reading that document to make sure that the conditional doesn't, or is still true? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Can you explain this a little bit more? Um, my understanding mm -hmm. is that when the uh, T2 is committed on that uh, uh, second step, mm -hmm. and then you go further on, T3 fails, how, yes. it, how is it gonna fail if it's been committed? Good question. All right, I'm just thinking about it. I'm glad, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, remember, when you say committed, all you're committing is a bunch of deltas. Nobody's going to delete them. Nobody's going to do anything to them. They'll always be mutable. So your delta T1 
there's delta, this is conditional delta T3, and then there's T2. Even in Cassandra, these are your columns, right? You have this. When IngoDB reads the row, it's going to resolve it in that order, in not this order, but T1, T2, and T3. So when you first data center A, when you're talking about data center A, this is fine. There's nothing wrong with T3 because that's fine. Uh, by the way, the conditional is, uh, like I said, there's already going to be a conditional that is going to say that signature should be something, which is like T1. This is exactly what will be stored here. This will never get changed. So when, when EmoDB reads the record at this time, it's going to say, yeah, everything is fine. But when T2 arrives right here, and now when the record is read, there's a problem here. So it's going to go ahead and put that on the data bus. Okay. And that's only at read time that that happens, right? Um, when T2 gets written over in data center A, that, yes. that, that goes undetected. No. When yeah, when, when it's oh. replicated. Oh, at the time. Of yeah, yeah, otherwise it's, it's of no use. Otherwise you're, you're fine and dandy. You're not doing oh, anything until another read happens. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So when, when, when T2 comes over here, replicates, okay, that's replicate when it's going to trigger. Okay. That was his earlier question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So even though it triggers, the record still looks like you've written on the board. It's, it's always going to, exactly. It's right. all, oh, because you're just appending. It's always going to be this. It's always going to be that. Yeah. It's always going to be that. Nobody's going to change this at all. And that is where, you know, your no... Compaction. Un unless compaction. Compaction, uh, compaction. Yeah, yeah. yes. Compaction right. will happen. Yeah. But the thing is, nothing is changing in this. When compaction happens, obviously, we're going to erase everything and put a C1 here. Um, but... When you do compaction, is it also conditional? <laughs> because when you compact it, Side, so when you're compacting, you're basically writing the whole document. Um, you resolve this document now. You're resolving all the deltas. So it's right. just basically one JSON document at that point. Right. Some like of the intrinsics are saved, though. So it's going to save the version number. It's going to save um, um, signature. Signature, signature is going to be saved. But the key is that right. compaction only modifies old deltas. So this error is not going to be compatible with those results until you know, I mean, they, the results of them that they will eventually be compacted together once consistent. So once once, once you're out of, once you're out of that window, where it's, it's, it's an issue. And I assume for the compacted record, uh, are you just using the the latest time UUID from the record that it compacted in order to avoid the yes. race conditions? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And again, compacted is also a delta, by the way. Right. So this is a compacted record, and then there's other deltas that will keep forming after it. So uh, how do you ensure that no conditions are being checked outside? Uh, like, is there are there any is there any way to enforce programmers on no. the outside world? So you no. just have to be careful. Uh, well, they they have to uh, look into the data bus. What we guarantee is that when 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 something like this happens. There will be a trigger on data bus, and we'll, we'll be talking about data bus a little bit more. But basically, um, if the event is going to live there for some time, and when I say some time, it's not one second or two seconds. It's more like a day to a week, uh, basically giving enough time for the application. If, if it's down or something, it can actually come back up and, and take care of business. So. Again, compaction, and I, I, I guess everybody's on board that this is not like Cassandra compaction that we were talking about. This is just these deltas, and we're compacting it because Cassandra won't compact this for us. It doesn't know what this is. Um, okay, so this is, we have already covered this. I have a question for you. Yep. Do your deltas preserve the before and after state, or is it strictly, like, in other words, if I modify a row, do I know the before and the after state, or is it just no. saying, this is the new value now? This is the new value. So that it's not like you can kind of rewind and go kind of back in time and without needing to start from the 
pre previous compaction point and rebuild. So if I change the value from right. three to five, yeah. I can't just look at that delta and go back and say it's a three. You have to resolve the entire row, and that is why compaction is so important. Right. Yeah, it's not like you can look at this delta and kind of figure out what these two are. Right. It kind of replaces. How the delta the right out work? Yeah, that that's a good good point. So you know, as we mentioned, you can have t1 here, you can have t3 here, t4 here, and then t2 here. So I'm curious, like, what the, the, your company's approach was to the the idea that you know universal timestamps ultimately don't work in a distributed environment. You know, your 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 perception of what universal time is is very different from another node. So did you guys look into like vector clocks in order to do this, or is that too? complex and alternative, but it's really the, the one correct way to resolve we, distributed uh, nodes communicating right. and what came first. So obvi obviously, you know, there's a lot of discussion about vector clocks and, and you can think about it. Uh, but it boils down to this is um, there's a lot of overhead for running vector clocks. So yes, th it is true that, um, you know, NTP kind of employs a little bit of vector clock behind the scenes as well. People sometimes don't know this. But I understand what the question is. I mean, but we, we uh, decided just to go with, with time and the YDs. So that brings us to Databus. And uh, how does Databus operate? So for the Databus, we allow applications. Just going to quickly at the time. Um, we'll let. Um, applications create subscriptions for these tables that they created in MongoDB. And tables are basically segments in column families. Um, so when you subscribe, subscribe, uh, you can tell like, I want to subscribe, subscribe to this table that I created. And so anytime there's a change in a row for that table, that subscription will um, get an event. And after you do that, um, applications kind of pull periodically um, um, whether I have any events or not. So they're basically polling this data bus. Um, it's kind of like a DVR thing. So uh, system of records starts DVRing updates at that point. Um, it supports multiple concurrent writers and readers. So you can poll and then you can acknowledge them as well. There is no guarantee on order on data bus side as well. So although the guarantee is that you will get the trigger, but there is no guarantee that uh, you may get T3 in different orders, and that's OK. Um, uh, one thing that to help system record, um, to help in this regard, because nothing is in order, you do get version. And version is a little different from signature. While signature is a hash of your document at that time, so you can always ask for, hey, I want to know what my signature is at this point, and you'll know exactly what it is. This is an intrinsic value. Uh, version, on the other hand, is just an integer value. So it, it's just one, two, three, four. So you may get something like one, two, three, and then you get five. And you can exploit this to, to your advantage. You may not. It's totally up to you. But, but you can kind of see that, OK, I may be getting four soon. Uh, you may not need it, by the way, because maybe you want just the last five is just good enough for me. Um, again, it exposes a good RESTful API for people to work with. Um, that's how you basically subscribe. Uh, there are two parameters to look at. Uh, one is the time to live, and the other one is the event time to live. Uh, one is for the subscription how long the subscription is going to be there. So it could be a week. And there's also, to renew it, you just basically call, make this call again, and it's going to renew your subscription. Um, event time to live is basically that's how long um, events are going to live on the data bus until whatever happens first, either TTL or somebody acknowledges or acts that event. Uh, by default, I think it's uh, one day for both of those. And then you can also apply table filters um, on these things. These are not, um, you cannot have filters based on content, by the way. So you can't say that this particular status is approved is what I want or something like that. Um, but you can.
can use intrinsic value. So you know you can always say um, you can ask for multiple tables. So you can say type equals review, and I want to uh, I want a trigger for that, and you can uh, have triggers or subscription for multiple tables. Or if you want all tables, you can send in always true or just don't include anything, and it will just give you alert for every table. Uh, you can also, um, you know, there's count events. So this is basically uh, an example of our API that we use. So what happens when you check, when you pull for the events? And if the events are not act, they'll keep giving you that event. So there are two things happening here. First, uh, when, when you pull for an event and you get an event back, um, there's a claim time to live. So what happens is if I just provided an event to one application, for that claim period, I'm not going to provide um, that event to anybody else when they're polling. But once that claim period expires, and if you haven't acted, I'm going to return that event to everybody who is polling me again. So if you can also, by the way, renew that claim time to live as well. Um, so if you're, you want more time, you can always you know, say, okay, I'm still working on this event. Uh, let me work on this a little bit more instead of providing that event to anybody else who's going to pull. Um, and then, of course, you need to act that event. Once you act that event, then uh, basically that event is gone. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned before multiple readers. Did you also, I mean, multiple writers? Did you also say multiple readers as well? And if so, how do you solve that? Is that readers don't get the same event? It, it, readers. So that is how the uh, claim TTL comes in. So if you if it already gave um, one event once, then the claim time to live uh, kicks in. So as so for the next. Um, whatever n number of seconds that claim time to live is, uh, data bus is not going to give that event to any other reader. Okay. Once that claim time to live expires, then it's fair game. Then the next one, whoever called it first, is going to get that event. OK, so it actually modifies it in the database. Where do you store that? Yeah, so, so the data bus, that, that's a good point. Data bus is on a completely different Cassandra ring. It uses random order partitioner. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's, it's not the same in the um, Cassandra class, but it has so its own color. I have two questions. The yellow line sequence event is stored in Cassandra using a decent way to do queuing. Um, so you don't block the row. The claim information is stored in memory, and then we use consistent hashing to get you to the server that owns the claims for that event. Okay. Um, and so you, we can scale up and down, and when we do scale up and down, you're, the, the server that you have to hash for that event goes to might be. So in that, in that case, you might get duplicate events for you know, things were in flight at the time the server comes up or down. But otherwise, it, it works like that. So if your event is just a string, basically? It's, it's the idea of the delta and a little bit of metadata. So you don't mark ownership, we don't mark ownership in the database, it's just in memory? No. Because we want to be able to get tens of thousands of things you know, per second with it. Yeah. And so we didn't want to actually keep writing, it, writing uh, claims and evaluating exploration. So if you have to claim within a certain window of time, does that mean that your act could then be basically denied? If I don't, if I don't act in time, then it's fair game for somebody else to read it, right? Yeah. And so if my act, if my act arrives very late to server side, then how do I, as a client, know that? Maybe I process it, sent you my act, and, and from my point of view, it was in a timely fashion. But if from your point of view, it's outside the claim window. So, so let me understand. The Maybe I'm understanding right. claims wrong or something. But no, but but um, so you were saying that your claim period has expired. Say it's six seconds long, but when I'm acting it, it's five seconds or whatever. I'm yeah, five. I think in that case, is there an error that we generate? Or so it's like the, the basic rule of performing data bus is that uh, it sort of assumes no, no guaranteed order, no guarantees on duplicates. Like you, you can get duplicates, you feel yeah. be okay with that. 
could act something, but if your act got lost in flight, then you know the system's going to get back to you immediately. You'll be okay with that, right? And basically, the processing of that needs to guide us. Everything about you know the retry, there always be a safe retry opportunity to find some and or is kind of pushed down as far as you can, like as far away from the system as you can. You can. And so you might get the event again, and that's supposed to be okay. The assumption is that you pick the same time where chances are if you don't act in time, you crash. Um, so this is basically the last slide that I wanted to put for Blob Store, which is pretty much similar to System of Records. I mean, of course, there's no deltas, but it's like um, it's more for images. And the sweet spot is for Blob for a few megabytes, and um, it, it replicates um, to all data centers. And the reason why not Amazon S3, you can totally use Amazon S3 with CloudFront if you don't need cross data center or you don't mind like writing to buckets in multiple regions because S3 makes you write for multiple regions. But that's why um, we, we have Blob Store. Uh, this is just uh, basically getting everything together and we you can see we have a highly scalable architecture serving traffic out of three AWS regions simultaneously um, going to Akamai. And this is like general um, architecture. And I guess I'm done if you have any questions. We already got some really good questions. Sorry, I just forgot what was in your row IDs. What was the storage component? You had the 8 bit thing yeah. and then the table you do ID and then what? So you have an 8 bit shard identifier, then your UUID, and then your UTF 8 uh, content key, yeah. encoded content key. Are you, are you trying to um, figure out how this structure kind of helps with, with uh, segmenting the column family and also making sure that each shards are? Yeah, I, I uh, definitely understood the concept. I yeah. just wanted to check yeah. it out. Check. Sure. Yeah, cool. It's a good scheme. So are you using multi-get on that, or did you go deeper than thrift? Uh, thrift. Explain what the signature is again. I know it's a hash uh, that comes in during an event. Is it representing the entire document prior to that change, or no? At that time. At that time. At that time. Uh, uh, upon applying that change. Right. Okay. Right. So basically, we um, applied some intrinsic values for every document in MongoDB, just for this reasons. One of this is version and first update time, last update time, uh, signature. So if you want to do something like. Um, conditional write upon signature that is totally valid. So you can say, make this write. You can read the object first, get the signature, and then put a conditional write that write this only when the signature is this. So you're you're kind of making sure okay. that there's no dirty reads or dirty writes in, in the middle. But I mean, uh, I guess the important part of EMDB is and the change of approach is that it's very hands off. So as Sean rightly said. Um, uh, the data bus question that you had asked, um, we even don't guarantee you can get duplicate events. So you should be able to handle that. Um, as I said, we can retroactively fail a conditional write. But what we won't do is we're not going to come in the way of appending deltas. And so one of the challenges we have is making sure that the compaction kicks in. Because if you have like a really long delta list, and which is why right in the beginning, we thought of it for a minute and, and we realized that UGC, it's not a really like a lot of updates in it, but if you have an application where you know, you're know you just gonna work with one or two or like 10 rows, but they're gonna be updated like continuously, uh, probably not a good idea to use EMDB for that kind of purpose. This map, you can probably answer this. When are you guys gonna open source it? <laughs> 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 uh, Sean left.
<laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think this is uh, definitely a candidate for open source. I don't think we're ready yet, but we should of course think about it. Do you have a custom partitioner? What is there anything else custom under there? Uh, yes, um, the random order yes aside partitioner. What it says like in Thrift API itself. Yeah, or in general, like so, get splits is a little bit custom. Okay. But other than that, um, I know we've worked a lot of things in Prium. So basically, when you get a new key or you create a new key, obviously that is all related to the sure. uh, the file of a partitioner. But other than that, I, I just at least I can't think of it now. There used to also be a custom build of a Spina. You, you mentioned that the applications of the small D tenant supporting like Best Buy and, and yeah. Walmart. Yep. So how does I understand you don't want hotspotting, but ultimately is what happens that you end up having kind of interleaved rows from Best Buy and Walmart so together, and then you're scanning over that in order to just wonder like can can somebody else, another client of yours, have so many many rows to the point where it's affecting scans for this other customer because ultimately you're encountering both as you're so there are no interleaving rows okay there is a scan when the scan happens when when i give you splits so let's say you want to scan walmart's table right i'll give you uh 256 splits and the reason for that is i have eight bit chart identified right in front of it each one of those split is a sequential scan okay and so you basically once that's one call you'll make, it will give you a collection of split, and then it's totally up to you to completely parallelize everything and just get this a split. And it's very possible that um, you are going to get a split that does not return any document, because guess what? I mean, it's like we just gave you an entire space. And we're actually even thinking of, uh, depending on the scale and performance, this can very well be like a four bit, in which case you'll only get 16 bit, um, or 16 uh, splits, which may or may not be a good idea. Um, good idea because you have less range queries than 256 range queries, so 16 times less. Uh, bad idea if you know you have a lot of data and basically end up doing the same amount of work. So. Is there a max document count that can go into a split? Yes, so you can provide the limit to it. Uh, I think by default, John, do you remember what the limit is by default? Okay, so because uh, if you have the page in your in independently between splits, that could get complex really fast. Mm -hmm. Wait, are, you, are you talking about when you read? Yeah. You yeah. Yes, and it's ten thousand by default. It's ten thousand by default. So, so there's a, a function in Asnax that you can ask it to make a reasonable attempt at giving you a split, you know, or you know, a, a certain size split. Yeah. So we'll give you at least. So you'll, be, you'll get more if you have more than 20,000 or 10,000, what your limit is, then you'll, you'll, you'll get another split for that. Oh, okay. Does it use some kind of sampling to uh, determine that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> actually, uh, yeah, I should probably say the same thing, but the thing is that we that, that is the custom part, but, but actually um, Thrift, uh, um, I think it deploys Hadoop behind the scenes, but it, it does do some kind of sampling to give you the split. So, so the purpose of the split is to tune to how Cassandra multiplexes all the requests at the same time so it doesn't crash resources? Is that the purpose of the split? No, the purpose of the split is giving you um, basically a, a, a starting token right. from where you can do sequential scan of the document. Right, right. Okay. But is 10,000 is because, is that tuned to Cassandra so that? No, 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 that is completely up to you. You provide us the limit. We just have a default of 10,000. Oh, okay. Yeah, you can say that I just want 50 records in my split as a limit. Okay. We'll give you more splits then. <laughs> 